Thank you very much. Well, hello everybody, and uh, even though it really is pretty hard to, to have to, uh, to follow Don, I'm really thrilled to be here today to uh, participate in this celebration of the semi-centennial of uh, the amazing fossil that we all know with unique intimacy as Lucy. And that's not simply because at the time of her discovery, uh, Lucy was by far the most complete skeleton of an early hominin that had ever been discovered. And because as such, she gave us such unprecedented insight into the characteristics of the very earliest uh, bipedal uh, hominins. But it's also because I'm old enough to remember what life was like before Lucy. And it was a very different world from the one we're familiar with and sort of take for granted uh, today. Uh, for one thing, back then, paleoanthropologists were still quite freshly in shock from a very powerful assault that had been launched upon them by uh, this man here, uh, the ornithologist and the evolutionary theoretician uh, Ernst Meyer. In the summer of 1950, and in what was probably the most influential single speech ever given in paleoanthropology, Maya had addressed a gathering of paleoanthropologists and evolutionary biologists and geneticists at the prestigious uh, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory on Long Island. And in no uncertain terms, he had told this elite audience that they were completely wrong to have believed that the human past had been populated by this long list of extinct genera and species we see here. Well, so far so good, because he really did have an excellent point there. But then he went on to declare that in contrast to that jumble of taxa we just saw, the entire story of human evolution had instead consisted of this supremely simple linear progression a progression that, moreover, had taken place only within the single genus Homo. Even worse, my claim that within that unique lineage, there had existed a mere three species, and that each of those species had sort of lost its identity as it gradually uh, evolved into the next one in the uh, series. And that, of course, meant in turn that these constantly changing species could not, even in principle, be the visually recognizable units that paleontologists have to depend on uh, as their basic units of analysis. So you might have thought that at least the paleontologists in uh, Meyer's audience uh, <coughs> would have pushed the back a bit against this nihilistic attack um, on their uh, science by someone who had likely never even seen a hominid uh, fossil in his life. But in the event, and for very complicated reasons, nearly all of the paleontological establishment immediately capitulated pretty much instantaneously to Meyer's attack. And indeed, so traumatized were these guardians of the human fossil record that for over a decade, Barely anybody in the business even dared to uh, refer to uh, a species name in print, preferring to just refer to individual fossils when they were talking about the human fossil record. Well, so profound was the uh, effect of uh, Myers' assault that some 14 years passed in this sort of post-crisis paralytic mode uh, before things began to open up again. And that opening came in 1964, when these uh, wise men, three wise men, uh, Louis Leakey and uh, Philip Tobias and John Napier, uh, added the new species Homo habilis to the uh, hominin uh, roaster. Uh, now, at a time when the range of morphologies known in the hominin past was about to blossom, uh, you might have thought that this addition to the uh, genus Homo would actually turn out to be quite helpful. But actually, it really wasn't, because it wasn't made in the context of any coherent attempt to make sense out of the steadily uh, increasing range of hominin morphologies. Instead, the tendency was to try to continue to force them into continuous uh, lineages. <clears throat> 
and um, that was uh, a real uh, uh, a real issue because, uh, in fact, Homo habilis had been named in the spirit of Lewis Leakey's romantic belief in the then popular notion of man the toolmaker, and of course in the service of his very personal quest for the manufacture of the uh, very early sewn tools that he and his wife Mary uh, were finding at uh, Tanzania's Olduvai Gorge. Um, so while the new species of Homo habilis in 1964 did create a little bit of extra uh, taxonomic elbow room among the hominins, it really uh, was not in the long run very useful systematically. But both soon and inevitably, the sheer pressure of accumulating discoveries began to point out very painfully how um, threadbare Maya's uh, linear scheme actually was. And for example, in retrospect, it's pretty easy for us to see that by the time the 1970s came around, Richard Leakey's discoveries in the Turkana Basin of northern Kenya were already turning up an altogether unanticipated range of hominid morphologies in the African Playa Pleistocene. Now, at this point, I feel I really must make a big shout out to the uh, Leakey family in all its generations, uh, because they have truly, truly made a monumental uh, contribution to, uh, to paleoanthropology. But nonetheless, because Maya had driven paleoanthropology into that strictly minimalist mindset, all new Turkana Basin fossils were assigned to the genus Homo unless they were uh, uh, robust Australopiths of the kind you see at the top uh, right and top center uh, in this picture here. And for several years, and for reasons that are still not entirely clear, it was strictly against policy at Turkana to assign non-robust hominins to any particular species at all. And I would uh, blame that on the lingering uh, influence of Ernst Meyer. And finally, when it did become okay to give larger brain Turkana fossils, like the ones that we see at the top here, a species identity, the name chosen was Homo erectus. Even though that name actually belonged to the Javan fossil you see at the bottom of this image here, which was almost a million years younger than the African forms had been found on the opposite side of the world from them and had precious few morphological similarities in common with them. So just to summarize, in the early 1970s, establishing a solid systematic framework for the hominins was not a general priority for uh, paleoanthropologists. And that, I think, made it particularly fortunate that business was done rather differently by the scientists who were working at Hadar in northern Ethiopia, which was, of course, where Don Johansson and his colleagues began making their extraordinary stream of discoveries in 1973 and where Lucy herself turned up in 1974. Now, as you can all recall, there was a lot of initial debate about how to interpret the large range of uh, particularly size uh, that was um, uh, encountered in this uh, assemblage. But by 1978, a defensible decision had been arrived at to include all of them in the single uh, new species, Australopithecus afarensis, which of course was exemplified by Lucy herself. And as we can see depicted in this 1979 diagram, the new species was considered to be ancestral both to the later South African Australopithecines on the one hand and to the later Homo lineage on the other. And the key thing about this hypothesis here was not whether it was right or whether it was wrong, but that once it had been settled upon, a point of reference had been established. A point of reference both for the rational discussion of the species diversity that existed in the African prior Pleistocene record and for determine, determining the relationships among the species that were represented. So there really was a very profound difference 
between the Hadar and the Turkana scientists in their approaches to the hominin record and to the questions they were asking about it. The Turkana group represented the traditional uh, paleoanthropological distrust of uh, systematics, while the Hadar folks differed in being explicitly interested in identifying the species that they had to hand and in uh, <clears throat> establishing the relationships among uh, those uh, species. And I think that difference was never more dramatically on display than it was in 1981 at a famous debate uh, between Don Johansson and Richard Leakey that was nationally televised from the uh, American Museum of Natural History in New York City. With the uh, legendary uh, newsman Walter Cronkite as the mediator, Don and Richard uh, took to the stage to expound upon the significance of the uh, respective hominin uh, fossil finds that they had made. And after some initial pleasantries, the uh, sparring began in earnest. And eventually, Don reached under his chair and brought out this chart here. And as you can see, it bore Don's uh, published phylogeny on one side uh, against the time scale, and on the other side was just a blank time scale. Well, of course, you could see immediately what was just about to happen. And uh, Don handed uh, Richard a marker pen and challenged him to write in his own theory of relationships in the blank area on the chart. And uh, of course, Richard was somewhat nonplussed by, by all of this. And he thought about this kind collegial invitation for a minute or two. And then he reached forward and he brusquely uh, crossed out the, uh, uh, the, the family tree, um, as you can see on the left in this image here. And when he was asked what he would replace it with, he wrote in not an alternative family tree, because after all, he wasn't even interested in having one. Um, he instead wrote in the large question mark that you see on the right. And I think that question mark perfectly symbolized the traditional paleoanthropological disregard for systematics, for the science of recognizing species and uh, establishing relationships among them. Well, in retrospect, it's possible, I think, for us to recognize this moment of high drama on national TV as the perfect embodiment of a crucial transition, a transition that was actively taking place at the time between an older and a more modern way of understanding the human fossil record. Prior to the discovery of Lucy and her relatives, few paleoanthropologists had ever cared very much about systematics. But after the discovery and the initial analysis of Lucy, the need to have a basic systematic framework whenever you talked about human evolution could never again be entirely ignored. And that new reality, I think, really did symbolize a critical turning point in paleoanthropology. Because the uh, traditional way of doing business had not merely served very efficiently to disguise the inadequacy of Ernst Meyer's gradualist scheme of human evolution. It had also made it possible to cling on to the seductive notion that human evolution had sort of been a heroic and single-minded struggle from primitiveness to, to perfection under, of course, the guiding hand of uh, natural selection. But after Lucy had come on the scene, demanding to be fitted into the larger picture, everything had changed. The extra taxonomic space that Lucy created eventually allowed a much more dynamic and actually a much more nuanced also picture uh, of human evolution to unfold as each new discovery made it harder to ignore the fact that human evolution had not been a simple matter of linear improvement over the eons. Instead, the human evolutionary story had clearly been a complex one of trial and error as new species continuously emerged to explore the many ways in which there evidently are to be a hominin.
as the millennia ticked by, many different contenders had been thrust out onto the environmental stage to uh, compete for ecological space with a huge range of challenges that included uh, very close relatives of their own. Now, most of those uh, uh, hominin species undoubtedly perished without issue. But a lucky few were in the right place at the right time and gave rise to descendant species. And the inescapable implication of a history of this kind is that our own species, Homo sapiens, actually acquired its unusual lonely status as the only hominin on the uh, planet through a process of triage rather than through constant optimization over the eons. And accurately knowing this is actually critical for our own understanding of ourselves today because a trial and error origin helps us to explain why after so many millions of years of evolution, we human beings are still such manifestly imperfect creatures. It helps us to explain why for all of our amazing rational capacities, uh, our individual behaviors are still so murky and often contradictory. And it also tells us, of course, why this elusive human condition of ours is so much more easily observed by poets than it is to be explained by scientists who still have a massive job ahead of them. Thank you very much.